Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many familiar names. I can't see your faces, but I can see your name. Um, and I'm thrilled uh, to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of the Museum of Old Newberry. Uh, as you all, I'm sure, know, we are a membership organization and uh, we're able to bring you events like this one thanks to the generosity of our members. So if you are not currently a member of the museum, please do consider joining us. We have lots of exciting uh, events coming up. I'll be back with you at the end of uh, Lisa's wonderful uh, talk. Uh, but in the meantime, I've asked Bill Quigley, who is the our board member and the chair of our program committee, uh, to introduce our speaker. So over to you, Bill. Thank you, Bethany. All right, our guest speaker tonight, Lisa Barbash, will discuss the research and a variety of scholarly perspectives involved in the production of, of the book, To Make Their Way in the World, The Enduring Legacy of the Zeely Daguerreotypes. That book was published just last year. It's an anthology of essays by prominent scholars from the disciplines of history, anthropology, art history, and American studies. Lisa is curator of visual anthropology at Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology, where by happenstance, the Zeely daguerreotypes were discovered in the 1970s. Her talk tonight concerns the larger subject of slavery and race in America that seven other historians and scholars addressed with different focal points two and a half weeks ago during our museum's day-long historical symposium on race and slavery in New England. Some of you here tonight also attended that symposium. Coincidentally, and completely unrelated to the subject of Lisa's talk tonight, she and I met in the winter of 2017-18, when she very generously assisted one of my students at the Governor's Academy, who was researching a US Army general who significantly spurred the redevelopment of South Korea's infrastructure, economy, and higher education institutions in the devastating wake of the Korean War. Because Lisa was working on a manuscript about a photographer assigned to General Richard Whitcomb's post in Pusan, Korea, she had valuable information and advice for my student, whose project was complicated by the fact that no biographies or histories had ever been written about General Whitcomb. That student, Chloe Kim, presented her work here at the museum in March of 2019. Lisa's professional career began as a documentary filmmaker she co-directed with Lucian Castain Taylor, the 1992 film, In and Out of Africa, and the 2009 film, Sweetgrass. The latter film garnered multiple prize nominations for the Independent Spirit Awards, the Gotham Award, the IDA Documentary Award, and the Cinema Eye Awards. Also with Castain Taylor, Lisa co-wrote Cross-Cultural Filmmaking, a handbook for making documentary and ethnographic films and video. And she co-edited an anthology titled The Cinema of Robert Gardner. Lisa's book, Where the Roads All End, Photography and Anthropo Anthropology in the Kalahari, won the 2017 John Collier Award from the Society for Visual Anthropology for visual excellence in the use of still photography. The book that she will be talking about tonight, which she co-wrote and co-edited with two colleagues, received first prize in the 2021 Rencontre d'Arles Photographic Book Awards. Welcome, Lisa. We're really excited to have you. And the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Bill, for that lovely introduction. I'm so thrilled to be here. I, I wish I could be there in person, but we, we all know what it's like these days. I am happy uh, to follow on the footsteps of two of the authors from the book that I'm going to be talking about, Manisha Sinha 
and John Stoffer, who spoke recently at the symposium, you all hosted uh, race and slavery in New England. And I understand that was an outstanding event and congratulations for that. I am really happy to be a part of your inquiry into such difficult issues that concern us now. Um, although they're, they're based in history, they, they continue to, to plague us to, to this day. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Just, there we, there we go. Um, I am speaking to you from my home uh, right next to Cambridge. Um, and I work at the Peabody Museum at Harvard. And the Peabody Museum and the Cambridge campus at Harvard are located on the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people. And we strive to honor this relationship in ways that are authentic and collaborative. Uh, today, I will be speaking about the production of the book to make their own way in the world, the enduring legacy of the Zeely daguerreotypes. It's a publication of Aperture in the Peabody Museum under the editorial leadership of Brendan Emser and Kate O'Donnell. It's the product of about 13 years of work and research and emerged at the end of 2020. It's important that I acknowledge before anything else that this book concerns seven people who unwillingly participated in the taking of their photographs in 1850. The ordeal of the people who, whose pictures were taken, Alfred, Delia, Drena, Fasina, Jack, Jem, and Renty has profound resonance today. We, the editors, Molly Rogers and uh, uh, Molly Rogers, Deborah Willis, and I felt it essential that we tell their stories as best we could with the hope that others may add to this conversation in the future. And this is part of the afterword of our book. The book project was initiated by Pamela Girardi, myself, and John Stoffer, who, as I just said, spoke here recently. It builds on original research by Eleanor Reichlin and Molly Rogers. So as Bill started to uh, allude to this, um, it concerns uh, the fact that in 1976, some 35 daguerreotype photographs were found by chance in an attic cabinet in Harvard's Peabody Museum. These are some of them. So daguerreotypes were one of the earliest photographic technologies having been invented along with photography itself in 1839. Daguerreotypes were an elaborate process that involved uh, mercury vapor, a number of coating, coating, uh, shining and coating of a plate, exposing it to, to vapor, um, various metals, silver and copper. And uh, in the end, um, after a subject held very still for a significant amount of time, a daguerreotype would be produced and uh, then developed in, in a studio. Um, they were also used for landscapes. Um, and also for scientific purposes, since they were the newest and best way to visually document something. Now these particular daguerreotypes were a little unusual. They were of people of different ethnicities and some of them were not completely clothed. Many of the daguerreotypes that were found at that time were taken in frontal and side positions. We call these anthropometric or ethnological poses. Viewers would be meant to compare each pose with those of another sitter in order to come to some kind of pseudo-scientific conclusion about what their physical features revealed about their inner nature and about their biology. 15 of these photographs were profile and frontal pictures taken by photographer Joseph Zeely of seven African and US born people enslaved in Richmond County, South Carolina. 
You can see Zili's name. I'm not sure if you can see my, uh, my, my mouse here, but you can see Zili's name stamped into the red velvet on the left side of the cases. This is a picture of a man called Jack. He was one of the people whose photograph was taken, both in that frontal position and in the side position. Now, sitters for daguerreotypes, uh, for the most part, when they went to a studio and had control over their own lives, would pose with clothes and objects that they cherished, even pets at some times. This was not the case with Jack and the other six people photographed in, by Zeely in 1850. One of the things that was unusual about the daguerreotypes is um, that we really didn't know who they were connected to or why they were taken, but they did have these labels, these handwritten labels attached to the cases. And in Jack's case, we see that Jack was a driver or a kind of overseer, so we know the occupations of many of the people. He was from Guinea, supposedly, and he worked on the plantation. He was enslaved on the plantation of B.F. Taylor Esquire in Columbia, South Carolina. Now, the other people here uh, that, that are part of this, um, the, the people who were uh, photographed by Zeely in 1850 are Jem, who was a Gullah person and was enslaved by mechanical engineer F.W. Green, so may have worked on building projects in Columbia. Fasina was a carpenter on the plantation of Colonel Wade Hampton II and may have helped to build the Hampton Mansion Millwood. We have down here Alfred, who was described as Fula or Fulani and was likely enslaved by engineer John Lomas. So he might've worked as a mechanic, a farmer or an artisan. Jack, who we've just seen, his daughter, Drena, Renty from Congo and his daughter, Delia, were all four enslaved by Benjamin Franklin Taylor and probably toiled on the cotton fields of Taylor's Grubfield Plantation. We also um, have found out from one of the researchers, Greg Hekimovich, that Delia may have worked as a blacksmith. Now, why were these pictures taken and what were they meant to do? After a great deal of research, Peabody Museum curator Eleanor Reichland determined that the labels were written by Robert Gibbs, who was a doctor who lived in the city of Columbia. Gibbs attended to people who labored at the local plantations. And in 1850, after speaking with Harvard scientist Louis Agassiz, who was speaking at a conference down in Charleston, South Carolina, Gibbs invited Agassiz to visit businesses in Colombia to see enslaved people who had come directly from different places in Africa, which Agassiz was seeking in order to provide evidence for one of his theories that. I'll be talking about in a minute. Presumably during that visit, they then selected people to be photographed and Gibbs commissioned the local garotypist, Joseph Zeely, to take photographs in his studio. Agassiz, Louis Agassiz, was a renowned scientist from Switzerland. He was a scientific darling of the American intelligentsia, a kind of Margaret Mead of his day, he was a Harvard professor who founded the Museum of Comparative Zoology. He intended to use these daguerreotypes to support the theory of polygenesis. This was the idea that rather than all humans descending from one origin, peoples of different races were of different origins, some superior to others. This was a heinous notion of scientific racism that was discredited even in its day by in part some of Agassiz's Harvard colleagues and certainly disproved by Charles Darwin later um, that decade. Agassiz published, uh, he did not publish these, these daguerreotypes. He publicly presented them only once that we know about. And then he put them away and they were lost to history 
until their rediscovery in the attic cabinet at the Peabody Museum. Now these are the only physical remains of any of the buildings associated with the enslaved subjects. It is Millwood Plantation owned by the Wade Hampton family in Richland County, South Carolina. It is possible that Fasina, seen here, who was a carpenter, might have helped to build it. This photograph is the best documentation of the labor it took to build such plantations, uh, such as Millwood. The title of this book comes from an 1861 essay by the great Frederick Douglass, who understood well the power of photography and was himself the most photographed American of his time. He said, pictures like songs should be left to make their own way in the world. All they can reasonably ask of us is that we place them on the wall in the best light and for the rest, allow them to speak for themselves. Now, in our case, we did not just allow these pictures to speak for themselves. We felt they needed a good deal of interpretation and that the people to do that interpretation should not just be one single scholar, such as myself or other museum curators. We needed to ask various scholars who've been thinking about the daguerreotypes and issues of race, slavery, and photography to collaborate with us on a large scale project to uncover uh, the story of these daguerreotypes and, and to think about what, what they mean for today and for the future. So this is the table of contents for the book. Um, it was edited by Molly Rogers, Deborah Willis, and myself. It contains interdisciplinary contributions from 23 different authors and artists, including photography by artist Harry May Weems and reflections by Harvard students and their professor, Robin Bernstein. And I will get to, I'm, I'm gonna go through each author's contributions because I think they're all significant. And this was an extremely collaborative project where we met during two seminars at the Radcliffe Institute that John Stoffer and I ran. And um, the editing of the book became a collaborative back and forth among many of us. People read each other's articles, gave feedback, and, and so forth. As the foreword by Henry Louis Gates, I forgot to mention Henry Louis Gates wrote the foreword. Um, as, his for, as he says in his foreword uh, regarding these images, that the underlying sin in their production is the fact that the enslaved men and women in the Zeely Agassiz daguerreotypes were not afforded the right to withhold, to give, or withhold their consent to be photographed. It may have been legal to take these images at the time, but it was profoundly unethical. So looking at these images raises many ethical questions. And one of Gates's first questions was, who are these people? Other questions? How are the histories of photography and slavery connected? Why South Carolina? What then happened in Boston when they arrived in Boston after Zeely and took them, Gibbs sent them up to Agassiz? How did black abolitionists react to their existence? Well, how did black abolitionists react to scientific racism? And it is not clear that 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 these were publicly known well enough for, for black abolitionists to be aware of these photographs. Um, did something like this ever happen again? How does looking at these images affect us and where can we go from here? Professor of English, Greg Hekimovich conducted a deep dive into the archives in Columbia, South Carolina, and he revealed new information about these individuals. He read journals, diaries, and accounts by people enslaved in adjacent plantations in order to get what we call a cohort biography. If somebody lived a certain way, uh, toiled a certain way, lived in a certain kinds of quarters in the adjacent uh, plantations, it's possible they lived the same way in Wade Hampton or B.F. Taylor's plantations. Greg combed the archives looking at maps, such as the one you see here of downtown, uh, 
Columbia. He looked at inheritance documents and property lists. Some people on these property lists were grouped by family, as in B.F. Taylor's 1834 slave inventory, which shows that Renty's partner was likely named Edie. In addition to their daughter, Delia, their children included Hector, Molly, Cesar, and July. And Greg's research into these lives of this, these people is ongoing. Another author, Matthew Fox Amato, found that the new medium of photography also helped enslave people themselves to maintain family ties amid the disruption of the slave trade. Through photographs that enslaved people could commission of themselves, uh, they found ways of proving their own identities. These were things they could use these to preserve memories. Uh, they could mail the pictures to uh, uh, loved ones who were no longer living in the same area and they could connect with them. Now, these are unusual circumstances where enslaved people in Matthew's main research was in Richmond, Virginia. Some enslaved people actually had the opportunity to hire themselves out and make a certain amount of cash and commission photographs of themselves. Um, I suspect that the subjects of Zeely's daguerreotypes were not um, allowed those um, privileges. Um, I'm gonna quote Matthew here when he talks about the people he did research on, denied the status of full personhood. Some enslaved people acquired photographic portraits, images commonly associated with notions of character, status, and individuality. Photography generated new ways for these individuals to decommodify themselves. Now, remarkably enough, there was another person involved in our project who had actually the only image that we know about of an enslaved person commissioned by a family. And Matthew Fox Amato had done tremendous amount of research looking for these pictures and only found written records of them. Scholar uh, and historian Evelyn Higginbotham has this photograph from 1858. And it was taken of Evelyn Higginbotham's great aunt, Margaret Ann, who was sold into the domestic slave trade um, shortly before she was sold away from her family. And it was, as Evelyn writes, a treasured visual memory of a daughter, sister, sold away. And copies of this picture, <coughs> sorry, copies of this picture were passed down from generation to generation of descendants. Evelyn Higginbotham's essay in the book also not only tells the story of Margaret Ann, but she traces their family back to slavery through other photographs. Seen here is their great grandfather, Albert Royal Book Brooks, who was seated um, third from left. Uh, in the jury for the trial of Jefferson Davis, who you may know was the president of the Confederacy. You may or may not know that that trial never occurred, but this photograph bears witness to his place in history. Another author of the book, John Wood, shows in his article, and I quote, the invention of photography not only democratized portraiture by making it available to many people, but also created a visual revolution, the effects of which have been as profound as any book. And what uh, John means by that is that prior to the invention of photography, if anyone were to have an image of themselves, they would have had to have had it painted or drawn. And that kind of commission would have been very expensive. Daguerreotypes were much cheaper. Photography made it much easier for working class people, and as I said, even enslaved people to own images of themselves. Scholar Tanya Sheehan, an art historian, situates the very unusual images produced by Zeely of the enslaved subjects 
as part of the tradition of Zeely's and other people's methods of portrait making of the time. These are two pictures by Zeely uh, taken in a studio. These people are clothed, as you can see, and looking rather distinguished and certainly uh, the way they would like to be seen. In these pictures by Zeely, also by Zeely, um, they, you can see that people were allowed to have objects that were important parts of their lives. And in this case, you see there's a man posing with his dog. I, I want to apologize for the quality of some of these images. I have pulled out um, pages from the book uh, because I wanted the talk is about the book and uh, I wanted you to see how they, they were placed on, on the page and they haven't all been uh, reproduced perfectly. They, they look very good in the book, however. Another art historian, Sarah Elizabeth Davis, uh, sorry, Sarah Elizabeth Lewis, grounds her arguments in art history, including painting. And she points out that it is one thing to appear nude and quite another to be portrayed as a body shown stripped, partial, partially naked, forcibly revealed. So how was it that this kind of thing could happen in South Carolina. It may come as no surprise to some people, but certainly to others. Archivist Harlan Green says that it is not at all accidental or coincidental that these daguerreotypes came out of South Carolina. And this is for a number of reasons. He says for three elements, there was an obsession with race, a drive to document and describe the natural world as a part of scientific inquiry, and the eager and early embrace of technology. All of these were part of South Carolina's cultural milieu in the antebellum era. How did black abolitionists react to these modes of scientific inquiry? Manisha Sinha, who recently spoke here, outlines the history of black abolitionists opposition to and action against the kind of scientific racism Agassiz added, uh, advocated tracing the efforts of Benjamin Banneker, the James W.C. Pennington, James McCune Smith, Henry Highland Garnett, and Frederick Douglass, all seen here. <clears throat> so we follow the trajectory of the daguerreotypes from South Carolina up to Boston. And what happened when they finally got to Boston? It was March when they were taken by September. Uh, it was March when Agassiz visited South Carolina. Sometime between March and September, these pictures were taken. In September, Agassiz had them, and he showed them once at a meeting of the Cambridge Scientific Society. And this was a meeting of a club of Boston intellectuals, including Harvard, uh, Harvard presidents, uh, and former presidents, um, um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and others. Wadsworth um, Longfellow and a few others were not present at the meeting uh, that Friday night at uh, the Cambridge Scientific Society, which I believe was at Agassiz's home. Um, there were only a few people there and you can imagine they must have passed these daguerreotypes around and probably did not have a very positive reaction because Agassiz then put them away. John Stoffer posits that Northerners who tended to be anti-slavery were not happy with these daguerreotypes and were also disturbed by the nudity in these photographs. Nudity was more familiar to um, Southerners because they would see enslaved people on auction blocks, but certainly Northerners had a very profound distaste, to say the least, for the kind of nudity that you see in the Zeely daguerreotypes. After the meeting, Agassiz suppressed what he considered to be, and I'm quoting John here, after the meeting, Agassiz suppressed what he considered to be convincing scientific evidence in order to preserve friendships, his social status, and the delicate balance he was trying to maintain among his Northern and Southern friends and colleagues. Agassiz really tried to 
sit on the fence between pleasing his northern colleagues and appealing to southerners who um, were thrilled with Agassiz's theories because they allowed them to um, justify their embrace of enslavement because Agassiz's theories were postulating that because blacks and whites were of different origins, they were of different um, um, calibers, that, that whites were superior to blacks. So one asks, could this have ever happened again? Agassiz put them away. Did he learn his lesson? The answer is no, he did not. Shockingly, 15 years later, as Christoph Ermscher tells us, in 1865, Agassiz led a scientific expedition to Manaus, Brazil, where he had a long, uh, I'm sorry, he had a, long, a, a young graduate student, Walter Honeywell, who was who buried in Mount Auburn Cemetery. I just found his grave recently. Um, Honeywell took photographs of partially and completely nude people, Brazilians, standing on the rubble strewn surface of a local courtyard. Here is one such woman and another, as Sarah Lewis put it, forcibly revealed. And um, I'm sure that Christoph Ermscher intended this contrast between a daguerreotype uh, as actually a carte de visite of um, Agassiz in contrast to this um, photograph of this woman. Um, you can compare who's got control over their own representation. I should say that these uh, photographs were um, um, glass plate negatives. That was a technology that was developed after um, the daguerreotype. So by 1865, although Agassiz was still fascinated by the notion that perhaps photography could reveal something um, deep and profound about race, um, he did embrace new technologies of photography. So what happens when people see these photographs in the archives? I think you can see that the short glimpse that I have given you of the daguerreotype is profoundly disturbing. Um, they are more disturbing when you see them in the archives. The images have been made available to university classes and to outside researchers and visits are scheduled um, around classroom use. And as I said, they are more the daguerreotypes are more, more difficult to view in person and a certain amount of preparation is given to students before they just walk into the um, archives and see them. And we asked uh, Professor Robin Bernstein after a visit that was very moving with a group of her students to ask her students to talk about their reactions to the daguerreotypes and for Robin to talk about what it was like to teach with them so that others might learn um, how to look at these very, very difficult pictures. One of the students, Kezia Clark says, in these intimate moments with each trapped person, despite my discomfort, I stared as hard as I could for as long as I could until I had to look away until it hurt too much to keep looking. I felt like a peeping Tom. But they are out there on the web, in books, exhibitions, and museums. Sometimes they are contextualized and sometimes they are not. And it is important to note that the responses to the images cannot be purely intellectual and best conveyed in words. In my own article, I talk about various artists' reactions and appropriations and reconfiguring of the daguerreotypes. Um, and these works tend to bridge the intellectual and the emotional, the visual 
and the textual. This is a work by Sean Sobers, a, um, who you see in the middle holding a um, cell phone. And he is a British visual anthropologist and artist. This is a picture taken by the artist who is also posing in the picture. It is called Delia and it is by artist and photographer Heidi Francher, who said that it just, the minute she saw the daguerreotypes and a number of artists have this reaction and writers too, she felt she absolutely had to do something with them, but she didn't know what. She thought and she thought over about 10 years and finally she settled on this portrait of herself as Delia and, and Fanter himself is, 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 is also black. Artist, uh, performance artist, um, Sasha Huber, who is Swiss Haitian, um, staged a large scale event where she hired a helicopter to take her to the top of the mountaintop you see in the upper right hand side. And it was a mountaintop called Agassihorn. And she planted a plaque on it and renamed to the best of her ability, the mountaintop Rentihorn. And Huber was also involved in a project with Hans Fossler that had a petition to the Swiss government to ask them to rename the, Agass the mountaintop Agassihorn to Rentihorn. And this was not a successful project, even though um, at some point, I believe Kofi Annan um, sign the petition. So we see here the best known uh, appropriation and reworking of the daguerreotypes in Carrie Mae Weems' transformation of the images in her 1995-1996 masterpiece. From here I saw what happened and I cried. Weems took four of the daguerreotypes. She um, blew them up to bigger than life size. She placed round mats around them, something like a target, uh, something like the, the end of a rifle. Um, she colored them red. Some people have said that um, it's red like blood. It could be read like the Zeely daguerreotype cases. She then took um, glass, placed it over, um, sandblasted the glass with the following um, logos um, and statements about these uh, daguerreotypes. And when you see them in an exhibition, they read like a long poem. You became, over Delia, you became a scientific profile over Renti, a Negroid type, an anthropological debate and a photographic subject. In an interview with co-editor Deb Willis in our book, Carrie Mae Weems said that Zeely and Agassi tried to humanize, the, I'm sorry, tried to dehumanize their subjects, but the power of the humanity of their subjects shone through because they didn't give it up. Their heads are not bent they are looking into the camera lens with perplexity and defiance, asking the photographer, why are you doing this? So it seemed appropriate that we asked Carrie Mae Weems to contribute something to the book, to invite her into the dialogue. And she created this photographic essay for us, um, some with new photography, some with photography that had appeared in other projects. She called this, while sitting upon the ruins of your remains, I pondered the course of history. She traveled to South Carolina and she photographed in the places that still bear the traces of the enslaved people who created the plantation buildings and ironworks that were left behind. 
And here we have Carrie Mae Weems uh, in a self-portrait gazing back at a plantation house. And, and really you, the, the title really seemed appropriate. While sitting on the ruins of your remains, I pondered the course of history. And it is Carrie Mae Weems' work that graces the cover of this book designed by Duncan White. It's called Splattered. And the image is a reprocessing and appropriation of the photograph, Sweet Potato Planting, Hopkins Plantation, April 8th, 1862 by Henry P. Moore. And this is another example of this circulation, appropriation and transformation of images that can create entirely new and profound meanings. So with that, uh, I thank you all for um, listening. And I am interested and excited to engage with you in any questions that you may have. Oh, stop sharing. Hi, Lisa. Hello again. Thank you so much for that insight into that incredible history of that topic. Um, I, if, if any of you have any questions that you'd like to ask, Lisa, you're welcome to enter them into the chat. We can have a little conversation about what we've been seeing there. Come on, chatters, let's chat. <laughs> Sometimes it takes it takes a little while to digest. Yeah, so just it's, it's a, it was a it was a lot of information. Um, it's not a book promo. It is just to say there are so many different ways to think about these images, and the purpose of the project was to begin a dialogue, not to end the dialogue, not to say we have the final word. It was we need people to, to see these, to talk about them, to think about them, to puzzle with them, and, and then create new dialogues and new work around them. Absolutely. I, I, the thing that struck me uh, when I was first engaging with this topic is uh, I visited the, I think it's a trustees and reservations proper, property called Agassiz Rock. Uh, okay. Apparently, he also studied uh, glacial drumlins, and there's a rock named after him that, you know, just the way that these people's names get sort of spread around, and then when you understand what their work entailed, it changes your, pers your perspective, you know, your perspective even on a giant rock. No, it, so, it certainly does, and I mean, it's interesting because Agassiz's great talents were as a glaciologist and an ichthyologist, meaning he studied glaciers and fish. Um, he was such a scientific um, rock star uh, that he really took, he took on many other topics, some of which he was not um, as adept at handling. Um, and certainly human diversity was a major foible. Um, he, he, started with a theory and then tried to prove it rather than an hypothesis and, and tried to prove it rather than going the other way around and, and was actually uh, a racist. And there are a lot of places around the world named after Agassiz, um, including a school in Cambridge, not far from Harvard, that a young student petitioned to have uh, its name changed from the Agassiz School to the Maria Baldwin School. And Maria Baldwin, I believe, had been an African-American uh, principal or teacher at the school. So that kind of renaming of Agassiz objects, even though the Swiss uh, wouldn't rename a, a mountaintop, it certainly <laughs> is going on uh, in the United States. Interesting. We do have a couple of questions from our viewers. Uh, from Claire Mitchell, we have uh, two questions. She says, I've been reading about this and the lawsuit regarding who owns these images. Can you elaborate on this? Also, how and why did this research get started? Okay, so the answer to the first question is yes, there is an ongoing lawsuit that started a couple of years ago 
that has been receiving attention in the press about four of the images. And because of the lawsuit, I can't speak about it and I can't address issues around it because it's the subject of ongoing litigation. But I think that's an important question and um, I, I'm certainly glad we didn't completely ignore that, that, that topic. Um, how did we get started? Um, the daguerreotypes were the part of a large scale conservation project in 2008 and 2009 at a newly um, established center called the Wiseman Preservation Center at Harvard. And a considerable resources and time went into taking apart the daguerreotypes, cleaning them, replacing the glass, um, and all sorts of other kinds of necessary uh, conservation work. When that happened, uh, we at the Peabody thought, wow, this is an opportunity to bring the daguerreotypes into larger public view and begin dialogues about them. At first, we thought it might be good to have an exhibition. We started talking to a number of faculty and community members around Harvard and decided that actually more groundwork needed to be made, a lot more scholarship needed to be done to really be responsible uh, for the difficulties uh, in, in thinking about these daguerreotypes. And particularly, we wanted biographical research to be done. It wasn't enough to just know people's names uh, and what plantation they had come from. We wanted to know more about what their lives really were like. And, and Greg Hekimovich has found out some, some things, more things than we knew before. And we were grateful to, for his participation and to be able to put that into the book. Absolutely, that was uh, extremely compelling. Uh, we have a question, are these images on view to the public now? They are not on view to the public now. Um, you certainly can see them on the Peabody's website and they are all reproduced in, in the book. If people want to see them, um, they need to ask the Peabody as a researcher and uh, researchers are allowed to come to the Peabody. These visits are scheduled around classroom visits. Um, perhaps they will be exhibited in the future. Um, and in that case, I'm sure you will, you will hear about that. Excellent. Thank you. People should buy the book. That's the well, I'm not, I, that's not what I'll I'm say, saying. I'll say it Get for it you. at your library too. <laughs> Absolutely. And we will have a copy at the Museum of Old Newbury as well that yeah. obviously we're always happy to lend out. Um, we have another question. Do we have any recollections of the people enslaved who were photographed? I think that uh, if I had to guess, that would uh, indicate, do, did any of them leave any sort of written record? Not that we know of. Um, one of the things that was um, deeply unfortunate is that um, when, um, during the Civil War, it was anticipated that the Northern forces would go through um, Charleston. And a lot of people in Charleston moved their uh, possessions to Columbia. In fact, what happened is the Northern forces pretty much decimated a lot of Columbia. And that included Robert Gibbs's house where he had a lot of, um, photographs, his photographic collection was destroyed. I am sure a lot of records were destroyed. Joseph Zeely, who took um, many photographs a day, um, they're only, uh, in addition to the ones at, um, the ones that are uh, um, enslaved people, there are only like five to seven other photographs that are known to have been taken by him. So a lot was destroyed. Um, it is not clear and it is unlikely that these particular um, people left any records. Great. Wow. Um, we have a question from our friend Jack Santos. We, uh, we know all roads lead back to Newburyport around here. 
Uh, he asked the question, did your research find any connection between the early photographers in Newburyport and Agassi and uh, Zeely, especially given the early use, goodness, I just lost my, Place, especially given the early use of the daguerreotype in Newburyport and Boston and the strong trading relationship between Newburyport and Charleston uh, and elsewhere in South Carolina. Well, Can you give us a Newburyport connection? <laughs> I think, Jack, you will have to do that research. I'm so sorry. Um, we did not, we did not get that far. Um, as I and I, I, I think it's fascinating and I will, I will look into this. I am not um, sure that I will find anything out for you, but that's, as I said, that's kind of the point of the project is, is to follow new avenues. Um, certainly daguerreotypes came over from Europe and took the United States by storm. I mean, if you think about the fact that, that they were invented in 1839, and there were studios all over the place by 1850. Um, there were black daguerre daguerreotypists as well. Um, Charles Ball, um, who took photographs both of black subjects and white subjects. Um, it really was a very popular medium, which is interesting to me because I took a class um, in making a uh, do, using a technology similar to daguerreotypes, and it really isn't very easy. I mean, there, there's a long process involved, mm. and there's a certain amount of artistry involved and understanding of chemicals and timing, but it, it certainly was enormous. And um, obviously, Newburyport was a, was a, um, was a large, um, was a place where a number were produced. Absolutely, we have a few very early daguerreotypes in the collection of the Museum of Old Newbury, which we'll, we'll show you sometime when you come yeah, up to visit. Yeah, I will come to see them. Wonderful. I do also want to mention we have a Newburyport connection in Lorna Condon, who we were speaking about earlier and whose name I see on my screen, who is uh, one of the researchers that was involved in the discovery of these daguerreotypes and who has long personal and family connections to Newburyport. So there you go, Jack, we got you something. <laughs> yeah, I believe Lorna was the person who opened the drawer and, and first saw the daguerreotypes as she was searching for back issues of, of, of publications. So um, she has a place in history, and a very important one. Well, that's wonderful. We'll have to ask you about that sometime over coffee, Lorna. Uh, we have another question. I'm interested, Lisa, in what evidence led scholars to speculate that Agassiz shelved the daguerreotypes because his associates at Harvard and in Boston scorned them or expressed disapproval of some sort. I ask because I've read that the image of the heavily whip scarred back of an enslaved man photographed in a New Orleans studio in 1863 at the initiative of a couple of soldiers in a Massachusetts regiment significantly turned Northern opinion more strongly against slavery. A quick coda, if the Zeely daguerreotypes had been disseminated sooner, in 1850 or 1851, might anti-slavery sentiment and activism in the North have been stronger? That is an amazing question. Um, I know the picture you were speaking about, Gordon, and it was used um, in, in, I think, a, a pro-union um, forces newspaper. Uh, we do re reproduce it in one of the articles in, in the book. Um, I think that had Northerners seen these photographs, they would have understood the humanity of, of these people and understood how truly evil slavery was. Um, and so we can assume that maybe there's another reason why Agassiz didn't show them, which is that his experiment was a profound failure. He was using them, he, 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 um, wanted them to be taken in order to prove the inferiority of Black people, and they prove exactly the opposite. And um, so he put them away. He um, talked about them in one lecture, but, but as far as we know, we, 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 um, we have no record other than a few newspaper accounts that on one particular evening, he, he showed them around. And John Stoffer looked and looked for what I call the smoking gun, which would be someone's diary, 
talking about what uh, seeing these pictures and how they felt and we have not found that documentation anywhere. Interesting. Uh, we have another question uh, from Sally Chandler. With the continuing exposure of these photographs, have any descendants of the people photographed come forward? So that is connected with the lawsuit. So that is something I apologize I, I can't speak about. That's quite all right. There are reasons for legal constraints for sure. All right. Well, thank you so much for that incredible uh, thought provoking conversation that we were able to have. I, I really appreciate that you were able to bring this to the members and followers of the Museum of Old Newberry. And thank you for your work and thank you uh, to the other scholars who worked on this. We were very lucky to have Manisha Sinha and John Stauffer uh, at our Race and Slavery in New England Symposium. Uh, and we're very happy to, that you were able to be with us as well. So thank you very much for spending your Thursday night with us, all of you out there, and especially Lisa. Thank you again. Uh, I'm going to do a quick pitch before we leave you for good for our next event. Uh, we have a Zoom uh, session, a Zoom program with, with Olivia Christoffi, who is who was our wonderful, one of our wonderful summer interns this year at the Museum of Old Newberry. She's the class of uh, 2022 at the Governor's Academy. And she has done some research into the origins of uh, Columbus Day in New Orleans and is inviting us to reevaluate uh, Columbus Day and, uh, and re-examine uh, the, the origin of that day. So that will be on Wednesday, November 10th, uh, 2021 at 7 p.m. And you can register on our website, which is newberryhistory.org. So thank you again, Lisa. Thank you to everyone who joined thank us. Thank you, Bethany. And thank you, Bill and Colleen and everyone else. It was a pleasure. Thank you to the audience for, for bearing with me. Thank you. And, uh, and go buy the book. I'll say it as an author. Go buy it. <laughs> we'll get it from the library. Thank you. We'll order ours today. Thank you, Lisa.